no, but it's real. Our words have power. What we say, what's said to us, it's very impactful, very important. And that's actually what, what today's question is all about. So we're in our series, You Asked For It, and this is week two of that. And somebody asked a really cool question that we felt would be good to jump into together. So here's what this question is. Uh, it says, why do I let bad language come out of my mouth? Right? In bad language, there's some vagueness there, which is cool. We'll dig into that. Or think it, think the, the, the bad language in my mind as a Christian. I know I shouldn't, but why do I still do it? Man, that part, it's real, right? Does that apply to anybody in this room <clears throat> at all? Amen. Yeah. One I know or, I shouldn't. Of us, maybe. Yeah. I know I shouldn't, but why do I still do it? Uh, so again, our question for today is all about our words. Uh, their significance, their impact, because they are significant and they are impactful in so many different ways. Uh, as I read this question, the verse that came to my mind, and I don't have a slide for this, is uh, Psalm eighteen twenty one. It says, death and life are in the power of the tongue, and those who love it will eat its fruits, right? <clears throat> we choose to speak, and sometimes we overspeak, sometimes we underspeak, and life and death can be brought in that. And so it's important to see that. But back to the question, um, bad language. What is bad language? Because, again, the question is pretty vague about that. Um, but it can be a lot of things. You think bad language, and there's one word that usually comes to most people, people's mind. It's to cuss, to swear, right, to say a bad word. So we tell our kids growing up all the time, don't say bad words. You know, all that. That's what we go to. But bad language is so much bigger than that. There's so much more to what bad language is as a follower of Jesus. Uh, maybe it's just foul language, saying words that you shouldn't, specific words. Maybe it's gossip and language that tears people down instead of lifts them up. Uh, maybe it's anger and rage. Maybe it's curses, again, tearing people down with that, not necessarily swearing. Uh, it's lying. It's deception. Maybe for you, it's, it's none of those things, but it's over-promising. You're not necessarily saying something that people would say is negative, but you're saying yes way too much to things that you can't keep your word on right? Maybe uh, it's the omission of words. Maybe you're leaving out the encouragement. You're not taking the step like mom did here in The Incredibles and lifting another person up um, and you're just kind of getting by without saying anything. I love that the person who wrote this question just said bad language because it kept it nice and generic for us and pastors like that. It's it true. gives us an excuse to talk about we all of it. We get to turn it into what we want. Not right really. On. I'm not right saying that. <laughs> yeah. yes. And that's not what I mean. But uh, so... These are not just random things out of that list. I think, one, we've all experienced some of those, probably all of them in certain, certain uh, situations. But the Word talks about this. God's Word talks about us and the use of bad language in so many different areas. Uh, so here's, here's a few examples that we see in Scripture for this. Uh, Ephesians 5, 4, obscene stories, foolish talk, and coarse jokes. These are not for you. Right there, right? Don't do this. Instead, let there be thankfulness to God. So some kind of sexualized talk or jokes that are inappropriate that cross a line, uh, go to a place that we shouldn't have let them go. Ecclesiastes 7, uh, don't eavesdrop on others. You may hear your servant curse you, for you know how often you yourself have cursed others. A very funny verse. It's hilarious, right? It's like you're listening in, you're like, did he say that about me? Sure did, right? And you feel you feel mad at that person, but then you realize how many times have I done that to somebody else, right? And so this idea of us cursing, slandering, gossiping about other people uh, and tearing them down in small circles. And then First uh, Peter 3, uh, whoever would love life, don't miss that. Whoever would love life and see good days must keep his tongue from evil and his lips from deceitful speech. You want to love life? You want to see good days? Peter comes in and says, use good language. Don't say bad things, right? Uh, and so we, we see verses like this all throughout Scripture that are encouraging us um, in our words, that the impact of our words is very real, and we should recognize that. Can I break in? Go ahead. Okay, uh, just, just one tiny thing. Sometimes people come and, and they'll ask pastors, what about cussing? What about swearing? Um, and let me just say this. These first two verses, especially in my mind, they give you the Bible's m much more clear teaching when it comes to the actual words and the language that you use. Um, <clears throat> We all know that we live in America, we speak English, and in this culture, there are certain words that are on some kind of a magical cultural list, and these things are swear words that you can't use. You can say the exact same meaning using slightly different words, and our culture is fine with it. And it's just one of those odd things. And I'm not saying you shouldn't watch which words you say, because there's a lot of benefit to that. But the real heart that the Bible will give you is these first two things. Number one is don't find yourself using sexualized talk, sexualized stories, sexual jokes. Why? Because when we find ourselves doing that, whether we use the curse words or not, we find ourselves making romantic love and sexual love into something small and into something dirty. 
And we sow that into our families. We sow it into our marriage. A lot of those stories, a lot of those jokes, they make a laugh out of objectifying people and treating them like they're the sum of their body parts instead of made in the image of God like the scripture says. As you sow that kind of uh, dirty and, and small value system into sex, your marriage will suffer for it. Your family will suffer for it. So don't do that. You can see what the, the Bible is saying. Don't go into those places. And you can do that stuff without curse words, by the way. It's not about the exact words. It's about the heart and what you're ultimately doing. And then the second one is like, don't curse people. Don't tear people down with your words. Sometimes we find very Christian language to tear somebody right down to the ground. It's still wrong. So th today's message isn't a message about do I use the right swear words or not right swear words. It's about what's your heart in this. Okay. Let's pray yeah. and go home. No, that's good. It's right. So yeah. you may be thinking we're talking about this like, okay, yeah, don't use bad language. Heard this my whole life. You know, mom and dad said it. If you don't have anything nice to say, look at you, good church that's people. Good. That's good. That's good. Don't say it at all. And I mean, there's truth in there, right? If, if you like. Is a, there's a good point. There's good moments where you just need to hold your tongue. It's just a very real thing. Uh, if it's not going to be something nice and encouraging or helpful at all. Um, but the reality is there's so much more to it. And the truth is, is we're really not good at holding our tongues. Um, we don't have control over the tongue. And actually, James would say that to us. So we're going to go to James 3 and spend a bit, little bit of time here. Uh, because the, the, the truth is, is we can't keep ourselves from bad language. So here's what he says in verse 2. Indeed, we all make many mistakes. For if we could control our tongues, we would be perfect and could also control ourselves in every other way. So again, he takes a moment to just be like, there's so much impact behind our words. And if we could have some control here, things would either look really good or potentially really bad, right? Understand the significance of the control of your tongue. In verse 3, we can make a large horse go wherever we want by means of a small bit in its mouth, and a, and a small rudder makes a huge ship turn wherever the pilot chooses to go, even though the winds are strong. In the same way, the tongue is a small thing that makes grand speeches, good things, but a tiny spark can set a great forest on fire. Bad things, right? So much power, so much impact, potential that lies behind the control of our tongues. Um, and then he goes to verse 6. And among all the parts of the body, the tongue is a flame of fire. It is a whole world of wickedness corrupting your entire body. It can set your whole life on fire, for it is set on fire by hell itself. We're just going there, guys. People can tame all kinds of animals, birds, reptiles, and fish. And don't miss this verse, say, but no one can tame the tongue. It is restless and evil, full of deadly poison. So we get just some truth from James, right? Of just no like, one can tame it. No one can do it. You, it's you, hopeless. You can try all Let's you want. Pray. Like we, yeah, exactly. That's the <laughs> prayer moment that we needed. Yeah. We're just confused. <laughs> but it's true. We, we, we want to, I think, and we, and we try to convince ourselves. And this isn't just this. I think we see this with all of our sin. How many times have you walked into a situation where you're like, I, I feel tempted to do something. I fail. And you're like, oh, no, no, no. Uh, I, can, I can handle this. And we just can't. You know, I, I do this all the time. I mean, yes, with sin, but also with like, I'm, I'm a terrible person when it comes to time management. I'll just be real. I underestimate how long it's going to take me to do literally anything in the world. You can ask my wife, like when we do the camp fundraisers on Sundays, I'm like, hey, Rachel, that's tomorrow. It'll take us 30 minutes to go set it up. We started at 6 p.m. It's now midnight. We're in trouble, right? It's like, but we underestimate what, what we can do or we overestimate, better said, what we can do, Right. Oh, I, I can handle this. I can avoid doing that thing. I can avoid saying those words in that group of people who like to say those words. And we put ourselves in a dangerous spot, and the reality is, so, is we need help. So James's point is not to be hopeless. James's point is make an honest assessment of yourself. That's right. Because we all struggle with this. Yeah, because we, can't, we don't have the ability to control our tongues. So again, James doesn't want us just to be hopeless. He wants good things for us. He wants mm -hmm. us to understand our need for God's grace. Because the reality is, all of us, as we're talking about this, we probably recognize where we need God's grace with our words. We need, God, we need God's help to come in and make things different. I know for me personally, uh, one of the things that, that I struggle with when it comes to words uh, is anger. Um, a lot of my words have come in my years with anger behind them. Um, I, I, growing up, I was the kid who got really loud when there was arguments had. And that just happened in our household a lot. And that was kind of taught, right? Because it probably was taught beforehand, too, in other households. And so that got brought into me. Uh, and it was once I got married, and I, Rachel Bustos and I got into a few arguments, and she was like, I don't know who you're raising your voice to, right? And it's just the reality, which is good. Now, she's very kind. Uh, but 
it was it was a terrible terrible habit to bring into the words, and it was brokenness, and it was sin, and the anger was flowing behind it. And it took uh, God speaking through her, and God coming to me, and and God going, "This has to change." Um, these are not life-giving words. This is bad language. What you're doing is you're allowing the sin and anger to come behind this and to tear down, and that has to change. And I think we've all got those things where God's like, this is bad language, and this needs to, this needs to be different. Yeah, I tried to meditate on this bad language idea, too, and the different kinds of bad language and what I struggle with personally. And I just really couldn't think of anything where I struggle at all. Um, Aren't you glad you go to church I'm here? I'm a pastor, and Aren't you know, you glad we that's don't your lead wrestle pastor? with life. Gosh, um, do you jokes, see the halo? Just, <laughs> just <jokes>. Wow. <laughs> ah! You're just glowing. Um, no. Um, like Moses. When we went through the thing, uh, I, I, what, what God kept hitting me with was criticism, that sometimes I speak words of criticism over people. And um, he brought my, to my mind a story, um, and this happened, I don't know, maybe six, eight weeks ago. Um, but we were right here at uh, Grace, and we were at the end of the morning, and one of our uh, volunteers, one of my friends, um, had done something, and um, I felt like it needed um, a little bit of adjustment, a little bit of correction. And like Ricky said earlier, um, some of the people on some of our teams are working like seven, eight our days here on a Sunday morning. And so what I did is I, I waited at the end of that day and then hit them with this correction. And as soon as I said it, and, and, and here's the thing, the words were probably right, but my timing was terrible. And as soon as I spoke it, I saw their shoulders droop and I saw it in their body language. It did not lift them up. It tore them down. And I had to apologize to them. And I got talking to Linda about this yesterday. It's like, wh what are the ways and why does something that is, is supposed to be constructive, right? Like, like giving people feedback truthfully so that they can improve, that should in theory be a good thing, amen? Like it should be positive, but it isn't always positive because sometimes our sin comes in and poisons the whole deal. And so... In this situation, it was my timing that poisoned the thing. Here's some other things I think. Sometimes our tone poisons. Like, we could be speaking truth. It could be good, but there's some tone, right? Because you're saying the whole speech to the person, and all of a sudden you get to a particular word, and you drop just a little bit of Tabasco sauce on that word. You ever do that? Just like a little bit of extra heat. And why? Because, well, I'm passionate that this gets across and that you hear this thing. And that tone and that moment is exactly the thing that cuts the person down. The other thing that I think we, we can do badly is um, we hit people with too much. Like sometimes what we tell people could be fine if we kept it at like 20 seconds. But 20 minutes later, we've beaten the person down to the ground. And they would have been ha able to handle 20 seconds. But we just, we gave them so much. And I, I think the final thing, and Linda's the one who gave me this yesterday. She's like, in all of that stuff, when, it, when something that, that was constructive feedback turns to criticism, usually it's because our motive was wrong as we gave it. Because instead of trying to build the person up, what started to happen inside of me was my motive started to change into perfectionism. That really, I want everything to be perfect. Let's be real. And I project that desire onto the people around me, and they should want to be perfect too. And by the way, my life is more comfortable, and I fool myself into thinking happy if the people around me are perfect as well. And so I've got a shadow mission there. I've got a dark shadow mission and so when I go to do those things, the reason I drop hot sauce, the reason I, I, I do it at the wrong times is because I'm trying to control the situation. I want them to get better instead of wanting them to be healthier, if that makes sense. Yeah, and I, I think you can sense a, a piece of like, you feel there's justification in this. Oh, we feel yeah. justified if we truly believe we're in the right, that we'll, we can say or do whatever means necessary to get them to understand that, right? So we'll use the bad language, but it's justified because I'm, I'm bringing truth, I'm bringing the right thing, and we miss all of the grace that God has called us to have to those around us. God help us. Yeah, for real, right? Yeah. Uh, so with that being said, again, uh, to, to, to get on to the next step, um, James' goal is not that we would just be hopeless. 
James' goal is that we would recognize our need for Jesus, um, that we need the grace of our Heavenly Father to help us so that we can become better because, again, we just cannot do it ourselves, and so we need to surrender. And, and I think we need to experience an actual grace moment right here, right now in this room um, because just like we reflected on that list and the Holy Spirit spoke to us on where we're struggling in our life, um, I'm very confident that right now at this point in, in the message, the Holy Spirit's been speaking to you, and you know where your kryptonite is on this thing as well. And maybe you're feeling judged. Maybe you're feeling condemned. Um, we're not meant to feel judged and condemned because Jesus has paid for it all on the cross for us. And what that gives us as we surrender to him and receive his forgiveness is it gives us a clean slate and hope to try again. So can we pray for that right now? Let's pray. Um, Jesus, precious souls are in this sanctuary right now. Precious souls are online watching this right now. And God, we are sensing the Holy Spirit come to speak to us about where we struggle and so, Lord, we lift those struggles to you. We lift our sins. We lift our guilt, our shame at what we've done in the past. We give it to you, Lord Jesus. We confess it, and we ask that you would forgive us. Why, wa wash us clean, Jesus. Lord, we thank you for your grace. We thank you that you are not looking for penance from us. You're not looking for us to earn this forgiveness today. We receive it because of the, the great work of Jesus on our behalf. Lord, give us that clean slate right now for the rest of the message. In Christ's name, amen. 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 All right, back to James, chapter 3, verse 9. Let's go. He says, sometimes our tongue praises our Lord and Father, and sometimes it curses those who have been made in the image of God. He's talking about hypocrisy here. Sometimes we, we do one thing, and then we do the other thing that we're not supposed to do. We're a mixed bag. We're inconsistent. And so blessing and cursing come pouring out of the same mouth. Surely, brothers and sisters, this is not right. Does a spring of water bubble out with both fresh water and bitter water? It shouldn't. Verse 13, if you are wise and understand God's ways, prove it by living an honorable life, doing good works with the humility that comes from wisdom. But if you are bitterly jealous and there is selfish ambition in your heart, don't cover up the truth with boasting and lying. So in the ESV, instead of prove it, it says show it, which I, I, I kind of uh, prefer that rendering. Um, what he's saying is if you're a Christian on the inside, show it on the outside. Because otherwise it's hypocrisy. And sometimes the things that we say on the outside don't match the heart that's on the inside. And ultimately, what James is saying across all of chapter 3, in the first half, he says, it's impossible to tame your tongue. And then in the second half of chapter 3, he's like, oh, by the way, tame your tongue. Which is kind of confusing. But it's very Bible, isn't it? It's like when Peter comes to us and says, hey, God is holy, so you be holy as God is holy. And you're like, how am I supposed to be holy like God is holy, Peter? It's, it's not in the accomplishment and the perfection, Christians. Listen to me. It's in your striving for that mountaintop. And the Holy Spirit, Jesus, will meet you there as you put your first foot forward. As you, as you aim for it, as you agree with God that he expects his children to walk in love to the best of their ability with whatever we have today to walk in love, he meets us there and he helps us to grow. So that's what the second half of James is saying. He's like, I know you can't tame the tongue, but get busy taming your tongue. Get busy at it. Prove it. Show it. Um, here's what we're going to walk you through. Um, the steps to tame your tongue, if it would be possible. Um, I'm going to give you these four, and then we're going to go through them one at a time. But if you're a note taker, that's there for you just to summarize it. Number one, agree with God that you have a problem. That's the first thing that you need to do. That way you'll surrender, you'll receive forgiveness, and get busy working. Next one is change the heart, and then your words will change. That's big. Speak life and learn to hate speaking death because the two go together. And the last one is reevaluate the talk that surrounds you, the work groups, the friend groups that you're in the midst of, 
that are tweaking your attitude every single day of the week. Reevaluate where you're at. So the very first one is agree with God that you have a problem. That's what Jane said. Is, is he's like, listen, the outside should match the inside. So you need to surrender this to Jesus and ask for his, his help. This is always where the Christian starts. We don't just need grace for the forgiveness of our sins and for the salvation of our souls. Christians need grace every single day. So that's why we, where we start. The second piece is Jesus says this. This is Matthew chapter 12, verse 34. He says, you brood of snakes. Jesus just called you a snake. How could evil men like you speak what is good and right? For whatever is in your heart determines what you say. A good person produces good for things from the treasury of a good heart, and an evil person produces evil things from the treasury of an evil heart. And I tell you this, you must give an account on judgment day for every idle word you speak. Jesus is tough, isn't he? But at the heart of his teaching here, he's giving us an important secret. He's like, don't just try to self-control the words that come out of your mouth. You have to change the source of them. So he's like, there's this treasure at the center of your heart, and either it's a good treasure or it's a bad treasure. Your words are just the consequences of that. Your words just flow from that. So if you want to change your words, you've got to change your heart first. Another version says, out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. There was a, a family situation that I was in, um, and I remember we were getting together with some people, and I started to pray, and I asked God, I'm like, God, don't let me say these things to this person. Help me to be nice. And, and God's response to me was, no, how about you change what you already believe about the person, and then you won't find yourself accidentally saying what you really believe about them. Oh, that's big. Yeah. It's not on, but I, thank you for the amen. There it is. So how do we change that? And I'm, I'm talking to the married couples here. I'm talking to the parents that have got kids. And you wish that you could control what you say to them. But what really needs to change, mom and dad and husband and wife, what really needs to change is what you really believe about them on a day-by-day -day basis. Because that's where it's at. So, for instance, if you're in a spot where you're in a spot of bitterness with your spouse and you're struggling to keep those words from coming out, the real change is in your next quiet time with the Lord, you begin to ask him to give you a spirit of gratitude for your spouse again, to help you fall in love with them again. You start asking the Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, would you remind me of how I fell in love with them in the first place, what I used to like about them? List it out, write it out, begin on the daily thanking God for all these things about your spouse and let that start to moment by moment, day by day, change your heart toward them. Then you won't struggle with your words as much. It's the same thing with your kids. Yeah. Uh, just a practical thing too that I'd love to throw in, if I may. Please. Very good. Um, is in regard to, yeah, I'm an adult, thank you. <laughs> um, <laughs> He's my boss. Youth pastors. Uh, yeah. uh, for some of us, maybe it's not the spouse relationship. Maybe it's something outside of the home, and it's somebody else. Uh, a, a very practical place to start that I think you could just be, that we can, not just you, me too, that I can be giving to God and asking God to help me if I have that feeling in my heart, if, if there's an issue of the heart there, is God, help me be reminded that they were created by you, that they bear your image. So if, if somebody bears your image just like I do, they are seen and loved the exact same way that I am by you, God. And so maybe that's your prayer. And I know it sounds silly, but if maybe you're looking for the, the, a place to start in that space. If God helped me change my heart, what that look like? Be reminded that God made that person the same way he made you, that he loves that person the same way he loves you. And so my prayer is, God, let me be reminded that they, they are image bearers. The Imago Dei is within them as well, God, just like it is with me, and you see them that same way. I think it just helps us as we begin to navigate. If that's the lens we see another person through, I think it changes the words that will want to come out of our heart and our mouth. Yeah. Put away in the laundry. Yeah, dude. So, yeah, I was going to save it, but I'll do it now. Do That's it. good. So another thing that Josh and I talked about um, is it's easy for us to just feel – like the goal as Christians is to avoid sin, right? I'm a sin avoidance Christian. That, that's that Christian. That's what my goal is. But God has not stopped there with us. 
He has more. He wants more for us and from us in this. Uh, and so the, the image that came to my mind is when it comes to our words, God's not, he's not just saying stop saying bad, bad words, right? Don't use bad language. He's saying bring about the life, bring about the encouragement and the good things, build up. And so the image for me is laundry. Who here loves to do laundry? Come on. Now let's be real in some of you are, yeah. And the hands down is probably the most honest thing I've ever seen because, yeah. The reality is, is when I say I'm doing laundry, <laughs> what that means is I've washed and dried and it's now sitting in a pile on our bed. But there's a whole other step to it's laundry. Done. It's done. Right? I'm like, I did the laundry, babe. And she's like, no, you didn't. You know? The reality is, is there's hangers and drawers and all kinds of stuff that need to be filled with laundry. Amen? The job is not done. And so God's saying, hey, do the laundry, but do it all the way. This Don't is like just a avoid. marriage seminar today. Hey, come on. Yeah, for real. Don't just avoid the bad words. Does God want us to not step into those? Of course. Does he want us to be away from those things? Absolutely. But he doesn't stop there. He's saying there's more to be done. There is life to be had, and there is life to give. So keep going. Put away the laundry. Step into the good, the life-giving language as well. Yep, this is so good. So this is Ephesians 4.29, what he just said. Don't use foul or abusive language. Let everything you say be good and helpful so that your words will be an encouragement to those who hear them. you got to speak those life-giving words. That's, that's what we saw the mom do in the Incredibles clip is uh, – Violet, shrinking Violet, was about to shrink down and not be her full self. But the mom spoke life into her. Man, she puffed right up. It was awesome, awesome stuff. Um, also, too, I think there's a, there's a way in which if you get used to as a Christian, so this is long-term for you. If you get used to as a Christian that you speak life over the people that you love and you get used to that experience of when you speak life, you see them get stronger right in front of your eyes, you'll start to get addicted to that experience. And the next time you speak death over somebody that you care about and you see them shrink down, you're going to hate that. It's going to be like fingernails on the chalkboard to you. Addict yourself to the right things. Amen? Amen. Yeah. Okay, last one. Reevaluate the talk that surrounds you. Um, there was a, a, a time where I was at work, not here, just to clarify. Um, and I was in one technology team, and we were, um, I'd been there for several years, and then I suddenly got moved to a new technology team. And the people that were there in that team were very, very negative about the employer that we worked for. And every single day at the water cooler, they went and they talked down our benefits, our salaries, uh, the environment. They talked down everything. Everything was negative all the time. And that poison got into me. And when that poison got into me, I had the most miserable year of work I think I've ever had. Because I couldn't shake it. And and there's just something about the influence of friends and people that surround us that you might think, even as a Christian, I'm lifting these people up. Maybe. Maybe you are. Or maybe they're pulling you down. And maybe face that. And maybe their thing is tearing down your workplace. Maybe their thing is gossip and always tearing other people down. And they always got something to say about somebody else. Maybe their thing is lying. It can be a whole lot of things, but just realize that that's going to get inside of you and it's going to impact your ability to stop that bad language that you want to be able to stop. Uh, I'm reminded too, just with the word reevaluate, there's a psalm uh, of David and he's asking God to be a guard at his mouth, to set a guard at his mouth. Um, And I think that's real. uh, Don't just let you yourself be the one who evaluates your own words. Ask the Holy Spirit, is, is what I'm about to say, God, are the things that I'm about to address or bring about to this person, to these people, or enter into in this conversation, are these life-giving words? Are these words that you want me to say? And I believe that God will convict us if they're not. I believe that he will tell us, don't you dare say those things in that group. Here's why. Uh, and so let him be, let the Holy Spirit be the gate guard at our, at our mouth to say, these are words that either need to, to be gone and stay, or they need to be, that they're words that you should express. Um, but there's just a danger, right? Um, again, we can't do it. Like James says ourselves, we need the Lord's help. And so ask him, Lord, guard my words. Be the one who helps me. Because if I, if I do it myself, it's just going to be rough. Amen. Yeah. Final thing, would you guys stand for this? There's this prayer that King David wrote 
And I think it really wraps this whole thing up for us and kind of becomes a, a mantra and a charge for us as we go forward. Uh, but I was asked to, uh, when I was a kid in Sunday school, I was asked to memorize this verse. And I can't quote it to you. I just remember the, the main phrase that it starts with because this showed up in my prayer life so often after that. And maybe it'll show up in yours. But David says, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be pleasing to you, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. May the words of my mouth. I can tell you how many times I've prayed that to God. May the words of my mouth. Can we say this together? May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be pleasing to you, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this uh, this time, God. God, we thank you that our words matter, God. They're impactful, Lord. You put power behind them. And that, that's an encouraging thing, God, because that means we can be used by you to bring about encouraging words to other people, God. We can be used to help lift people up, build them up, uh, give them hope, Jesus. So, Lord, help us with this. Be, be a, a guard at our mouth, God, with all the words that come out. Let the words we speak be life-giving, God, let the, and let that come in abundance, Lord. Uh, like Josh said, Lord, let us get excited. Let it become something that we're addicted to, that is to speak words of life, God, to encourage each other, to love one another, to be kind and gracious toward one another, God, to be kind and gracious toward ourselves, God, to trust you, Lord, and to know that when you call us to say certain things, God, that you've got purpose behind it, Lord, and you're going to use those words for mighty works, God. Jesus, we thank you for this time. God, we thank you for all that you're doing here in our church. God, we're excited for the future as a family. God, we know that you will take care of us. Help us to trust you with all that's here and all that's coming. We love you so much. Thanks for how you take care of us. It's in your name we pray, Jesus. Amen.